Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of our Steamy Summer Series presented by Osmo Education, where we get to talk to a, a selection of great educators about their perspectives on STEAM education and just really other uh, aspects of teaching and learning and student engagement and some of the great stuff they're doing in their classroom. Today, we're lucky to be joined by Joseph Kearney, who's a fourth grade teacher at the University of Chicago Lab School. And Joseph is finishing his sixth year at the school after teaching for several years in Chicago public schools. And he's also, as all of our guests, an Osmo ambassador. So Joseph, thanks so much for being here today. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So let, let's get right into it. And I know you, you teach homeroom there at the school, and that's you know language arts and social studies and math and kind of uh, a bunch of different subject matter. And you also collaborate closely with uh, educators across the school that teach the other subjects in this you know STEM and STEAM and, and others as well. Um, what I'm really interested in talking about is what's the importance of that cross-curricular learning and those teachers working together to kind of understand that these are not subjects that are taught in isolation. They're all important skills. It's part of a well-rounded education, but we really need to view them as how they connect together. I think that is uh, the, the true way of connecting all education is actually using STEM and STEAM. It's that, you know, bringing everything together, including all the subject areas, all the disciplines. And I think that brings a nice flow to education. When I know I get a joy when the students can talk about something in one class and then reference it in another class. And that's really when I, they get that aha moment. Like, oh, wow, like, okay, we did this. Okay, I see how this connects and relates to this. So I'm really excited about teaching and bringing those different subject areas together. Um, one of the things I like to do is plan closely um, at the beginning of the year with the different subject area teachers to find out what they're doing. So that kind of gives me an idea what I can do with my subject and how to incorporate their ideas with my ideas. Right, and we're gonna talk about a variety of things here, but one of the things I know you certainly do in your classroom is you incorporate the Osmo for Schools tools and you um, kind of work with them in various subject areas and activities. What, what are some of the ways that you use the tools? Well, uh, for me, it began with math. That was like the number one when I first, um, purchased my first Osmo kit. Um, it was several years ago. I had just had a daughter, she was four, and I saw an ad and I was like, this tool looks amazing. So I ordered that and then I got it and I practiced and played with her like all the time. And she was excited about it. And then I said, how can I take this and bring it to the classroom? And so at first I thought maybe it's too young, but I said, I gotta find a way to, to make it work. And the thing I did was start right away with math. So there's one of the programs called Tangrams. And I'm like, this will be perfect for my geography. I'm sorry, geometry unit. Mm -hmm. So what I did was use the Tangrams and I built a lesson around it. And so I had kids, we talked about the Tangrams, the dimensions and shapes and how to create images using them. And then I had kids take the Osmo and I created a math center. So on Fridays in my classroom, I have a math center where kids will use one center will be with me where we go over work, like um, things from the past or little um, lessons for the day. And then one where they uh, work on advanced materials and independent work, and then one Osmo. So the kids would love that rotation of getting to the Osmo and trying to find the images based on the tangrams. And I have to say at, at one point, they didn't even want to talk to me anymore. They just wanted the Osmo. And I know with you know, with the Osmo tools, of course, one of the big things is the way that it really improves students' learning experience and even you know they're thinking about the the fun first while they're learning, right? It's it's not it's a completely natural and, and really kind of immersive experience there where it, it really is that play-based, game-based experience. But you have the unique perspective of observing students in a variety of different subjects. You certainly have math where I think that's in a lot of ways is the uh, the traditional subject where a lot of students might say, I don't really like math. Math's not my, math's not my thing, but it could not, you know, it doesn't have to be math, but is there anything particular that stands out to you as the way using like learning tools like Osmo is improving students' experience with subjects that at the very least, may not typically be their favorite subject. You know, maybe it's not their least favorite. Maybe they don't even dislike it at all. But maybe it's just not the number one subject that they love. Yeah. So what I've seen happen is that 
when kids use the Osmo for a variety of subjects, their interest sparks more. They have more a desire to be creative and come up with an, an idea of their own. Because you know, using that game-based play, they're not thinking about the learning as much because they're like, oh, I'm just having fun playing the game. And then applying that to other situations without it. Uh, one I can really give a really good example of is a social studies unit, which I didn't think at first I could incorporate Osmo, but it, it worked out so well. So it's uh, uh, Osmo has a, one of their apps and it's called PizzaCo. And it's a entrepreneur app where kids get to like run their own pizza company. So use a little bit of math, social studies. So I created this unit where kids had to come up with their own business. And so we're like, we're gonna have a pizza company. They gotta create ads and create a business plan. And they were like, this seems so hard. You know, when I was kind of explaining it to them, cause like, this is weird. We're only in fourth grade. You expect us to come up with a business idea? Like, well, let's, let's, let's work it out. Don't, don't go too far off for what I'm saying yet. So we worked together and I, talked about the requirements and then used the Osmo Pizza Co. to help them understand the process. So they had fun playing the game, learning about entrepreneurship, like paying for, like once they have their profits, they have to pay rent and buy supplies and then having them work through all that. And then they had to create a business plan afterwards. So after they had played, they had a really good time kind of coming up with the plan and advertising. And they actually got to take it one step further by advertising around the school. Right. And so, and I know that you know, using the Osmo learning tools is not the only way that you promote student engagement in your classroom. And we had a chance to talk a little bit before we started recording about some of your other strategies, but I would love for you to share you know, some of the other ways that you like to bring student engagement into the class. Okay. Well, one of the ways I like to bring students, I am a, a very big comic enthusiast. Um, I got actually turned on to comics from my fifth grade science teacher. And so we had, we were learning a unit on adhesives and she had this sticker book that had the comments on it. And she like, every time you do well, I'll give you a sticker to go with it. And that kind of exposed my world. So I thought about how can I do that same due diligence for my students? So I um, use comics to help with reading a lot. Like I have a lot of reluctant readers who don't want to read standard novels. So helping them look at the images and talking about them for the future. Uh, really quickly, like him making some comparisons. So for example, looking at a group like the Fantastic Four, which are four characters based in science. So Mr. Fantastic flows and moves like water, the invisible woman's light like air, human torch is fire, and the uh, thing is earth. So using them to read this to kind of open up doors about science and to engage with students. As you know, comics and the movies are pretty popular right now. So I already have a nice fan base usually when I start the class. And I think that, that, that it's interesting because uh, largely, Comic books, you know, comic book movies, uh, it is, a lot of it is about dreaming big, right? It's about big dreams, what we could be, what those around us could be, what the world, you know, society could be like if things were a certain way, if we had certain skills or powers, or if there were, you know, certain changes in the access we had to the broader world or universe around us. I mean, there's so many of those concepts that come into play. And I'm wondering how that kind of influences you're thinking on some of the dreams you have for your students and you know even for yourself in your career i mean what are some of the things when you obviously think about your mission and your role as an educator um what are some of the things you really dream about uh well for my students for sure is i want them to be curious i want them to question everything and to really have really deep critical thinking conversations and to just like plan and figure out how things work and what can what can they do and how to improve so i believe in having a lot of conversations around everything uh, all the subjects i teach as well as like all the tools i'll bring into the classroom I, in my class i call it a community meeting a lot of people do morning meetings i do a community meeting where we just talk about issues of the day and so that helps them to get a pulse of what's happening in the world we bring world issues like talked about protests elections and any current events and bringing all of that together. So my goal is that they'll be well, well educated to go into the future for any of their endeavors. You, you mentioned curiosity. And I think, you know what, if you can, I mean, and maybe you have the answer, if you <laughs> can have, you know, a strategy that really can help teachers, I think, spark curiosity, because I find a lot of times, you know, that's uh, something that a lot of us really want, right? We want 
students to really want to learn or to want to explore or to figure things out. And a lot of that's natural. I mean, there, there is natural curiosity that many kids have. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that maybe it's, I'm curious about this and this, but not curious about that other thing as much, or, um, or, you know, how does curiosity and interest, um, you know, how do those two things balance, but are there certain ways that you really go about intentionally from day one saying, look, I'm, I'm really going to promote curiosity and really, um, this is something that, you know, one of the main things I want to foster in my students and here's how I do it. Um, a little bit. So what I tend to do is I tend to share stories a lot and that gets them pretty curious. Like I share my experiences in elementary school, high school, even college sometimes. And I really like to have them figure out or learn from me and I learn from them. So what I can say is really the number one trick is get creative. I know you hear it maybe a lot from teachers that creativity is a big thing, but really learn how to find your creative way to connect with kids to get them to open up a little bit more to you. And I found with me that storytelling, like being a great orator tends to, has always worked well with me. So when I can share my experiences, they are more likely to share theirs to get curious about other experiences. Right. And, and so I know um, another thing that you did, <laughs> kind of you know, moving to a, a related but separate topic is um, you contributed to the Osmo for Schools Teacher's Guide with some of your insights and expertise. Um, and I, you know, I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about what are, what are some of the insights you shared there and what was that experience like? Uh, it was a wonderful experience. Um, I got op offered this opportunity last year and it was kind of like the perfect preschool pandemic release. So, you know, I was kind of anxious, worrying about how school would function this school year. And then I got offered the position to create some lessons for Osmo. And I said, oh, this is great. This is what I do. This is one of the fun things I enjoy about teaching. So I came up with several lesson plans along with other teachers. And I just shared some of the things I do in my class with different subject areas and how teachers could incorporate that into their lesson plans or curriculum pretty smoothly. All right. Does some of that, what you were able to share there and, and even this, the strategies you've developed over the years that you've been using the Osmo learning tools in your classroom. And I know you initially um, discovered Osmo you know, for your daughter. And so and then you kind of learned how to bring that into the classroom as a teacher. Did you, I guess, some of the ways that you articulate and explain some of your strategies, did some of that evolve in the same way that your understanding of it evolved because you used it first as a parent at home and then you of course have refined your teaching strategies over time and said okay i could see there's a lot of promise here for these in the classroom but i'm sure each year you've learned something new something new you know how did your experience of first discovering osmo as a parent and then using it as a teacher maybe uh, inform the strategies you ended up developing in the Turing and Teacher's Guide for, for other teachers who may have a similar experience. Maybe they're already familiar with the tools uh, in another context and they haven't used them in the classroom yet, or they haven't developed their own classroom strategies yet, but they want to kind of learn from others. Yes. Um, so what I decided to do was not get complacent and try to find a new way to teach something every year. So same thing, like just like a, a new parent has to kind of figure out what to do is like a day by day basis. So right. I had to kind of tweak my lessons to fit the class. Uh, Cause I had some kids who weren't interested in any kind of tech or gaming things. And I'm like, how can I still get them excited about this even though they didn't want it? So some of the strategies I would use would be to take a lesson and modify it like for kids with special needs. Like they may not be, cannot engage as fully as some others. So how can I modify that? So maybe taking one of the games and doing a portion of it or doing something on one-on-one -on -one basis and then showing them the bigger picture and have them try to tell me how they would like to use it. So sometimes doing a survey with the class would be is another wonderful way to experience like, oh, let's try this. I never even thought of that. Man. So Joseph, we're now gonna, we're gonna go to our final two questions here that we're going to be asking every ambassador who participates in this series. The first one is, look, it's that hot, steamy summer. <laughs> we're all oh, yes. about ways <laughs> to beat the heat. What is your tip for our listeners to beat the heat this summer? Uh, one of my, my hot tips, uh, I'm very fortunate to live in Chicago and we have a really nice lakefront. 
So taking a ride with the windows down, might be my favorite song playing, blasting it, and just cruising. And that's just love that to just, you know, relax, and just zone out for a little while. Also, if you can get by any water, please do so. Hey, do you at least get a nice breeze coming off? Yes, there's a nice, lovely breeze. Even on the hot days, it feels really good. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's a good one. <laughs> and then our, our final question here, uh, if we're thinking about, and, and I think we're going to have a variety of listeners here, some of whom maybe haven't tried out the Osmo tools yet, some of whom may have been using them for a while, uh, but everybody's looking for new ideas. What is your number one hot tip for you know, using Osmo for schools in the classroom next year? I'll say the number one tip is like I have the most response from this one. It's usually using the words app. It's a spelling-based game, and they just updated the words app to have more variety in it. And I say if you start off kids with that, uh, even the reluctant spellers will have fun playing a game and kind of sometimes making it competitive is a good way to jump in. So like I start off with like word games naturally in the classroom and then evolving to the Osmo and that usually brings people in. So my one hot tip is try Osmo words with kids and that will sometimes spark interest. Well, thank you so much, Joseph, for being with us here today. Listeners, if you're listening on one of your favorite podcast apps, Apple, Spotify, Google, or anything else, make sure to head over to schools.playosmo.com to check out all the various tools and resources available and, uh, and keep listening to the rest of our series here as we're going to have more great educators sharing ideas that you might want to use in your classroom. So, Joseph, thank you again for being here.